Hello, my name is Carla Greenbaum, and I am the director for the Center for Interventional Immunology and the Diabetes Program at the Benaroya Research Institute in Seattle, Washington. I'm going to talk briefly today about understanding and harnessing the heterogeneity in C peptide post clinical diagnosis in type 1 diabetes. The overview of my presentation is five points. There is a significant variation between individuals with new onset diabetes with respect to baseline secretion around the time of diagnosis, as well as the rate of change of secretion in that period of time. However, age and baseline secretion explain much of this variation and when modeled can be used to predict secretion at a year. Significant amounts of residual insulin secretion are present in most people within a few years of diagnosis, and this limits the ability to detect the effect of beta cell preservation on other measures. And finally, while no clear threshold can be identified, higher residual secretion is needed for clinically important measures and physiological responses. Let me walk through the data. First, the between individual variation with respect to baseline C peptide around the time of diagnosis. This data is almost 30 years old, and it's from the eligibility visits for individuals being considered for the DCCT or Diabetes Control and Complications trial. As is readily evident, stimulated C peptide from mixed meal tolerance tests in adults or adolescents up to five years of diagnosis, you can readily see the wide variation even early after the clinical diagnosis and surely throughout that five-year period of time. What about the rate of change? I previously just showed you the data about the baseline levels, but what about the rate of change around the time of diagnosis? Once again, this is dramatically heterogeneous you can see that the rate of C-peptide can be looked at in a log linear change. So over time, this is data from about 150 individuals in the control arms of multiple different trials. And you can see there's a wide variation in the rate of change over time. Illustrated by these two signs of somebody whose C-peptide was pretty uh, stable versus somebody who had a quite a dramatic fall. The challenge is how do we explain this variation? And it turns out that age and baseline secretion explain much of the variation. And when modeled, it can be used to predict secretion at one year. Let me explain. This again is data from um, almost 200 people across five new onset trials. Here we divided people into quartiles according to their age and then modeled their insulin secretion over that two years when they were on the study. You can see here the impact of age. So adults, that is over age 21 in this figure, had a relatively flat slope, whereas those that were children, in this case, the youngest was down to age eight, uh, but subsequent data suggests a similar pattern, and older um, individuals, when modeled, have a very similar slope over time. But another big impact on where people end up after one or two years is really their baseline C-peptide. As evident here, uh, older people tend to have a higher level of C-peptide at the time of diagnosis as compared to younger cohorts. In fact, age remains an important determination of C-peptide levels over the long duration of diabetes. Here you can see from a study conducted under the auspices of the T1 exchange and published about six or seven years ago, in which we looked for whether or not C-peptide was detectable in almost 1,000 individuals at various times from clinical diagnosis, three to five, six to nine, up to 20, 20 to 40, and more than 40 years after clinical diagnosis. And here we illustrate this data separated by the age at which the individual was diagnosed. And it's readily apparent that those that were diagnosed as adults had a longer period of time where a greater percentage of people had detectable C-peptide as compared to the pediatric groups. But what does that mean in terms of modeling C-peptide? The important points are that while there's heterogeneity between individuals 
cross-trial analysis of placebo individuals demonstrate dramatic consistency in the natural history of C-peptide. It's so strong that given an individual's age and baseline C-peptide, their value at one year is highly predictable, and it can be used to calculate a quantitative response or QR score for that individual, as published by Bundy and Krischer in 2019. This has significant implications for having individuals understand their study results, which I'll walk through briefly, and for subsequent study design and analysis that T. Bonson will be presenting uh, in the future. Here's a, a cartoon to illustrate the concept of QR, where given the age and baseline C peptide, one can predict an individual's response at one year. As an example, Here's an adult with a high level of baseline C-peptide. We can then model and estimate where we would expect that individual to be one year after uh, being followed. In contrast, here's an adult, but starting with a lower baseline C-peptide. Here again, we can model where we would expect them to be one year after presentation. And that's in contrast with a child who may have the same baseline level as this adult with C-peptide, but we know that their rate of fall would be faster, and therefore their expected value at the end of one year would be down here. Now, this is helpful to generally understand the contributions of baseline and age in what the expectation is in a year, but it's particularly powerful when thinking about responses to therapy. Here's an example where the observed C-peptide as compared to the expected, which I showed you in the previous slide. This adult, though they ended up at one year with a quite high level of C-peptide, really had no apparent benefit of being on therapy. In contrast, the adult who started with lower level of C-peptide and ended up with a lower level than this individual did better than expected and therefore had some benefit of therapy. And finally, the child that started at that same level I was expected to have a great fall. If their observed level was here, you could clearly understand that they had a large benefit of therapy, even though their absolute C-peptide level was quite a bit different than the adult who probably had no benefit of therapy in this example. So one could even think about the conversation you would have with a participant. Instead of saying, gee, your C-peptide at one year is X, you could tell them, how they did compared to how they expected. Investigator, thanks for being in the study. You received the active treatment and the treatment worked. Here is your result. You did 60% better than expected. Participant, great, what does that mean? It means you have more surviving beta cells than you likely would have if you not received the new treatment. And we expect that'll make your diabetes easier to handle. So a much more meaningful outcome for participant is how they did with the therapy as compared they might have been expected to do if they hadn't received the therapy. But why is C-peptide the measure to use as an outcome in trials to preserve beta cell function over the first year from diagnosis? Well, first of all, it is a measure of beta cell function. It's been demonstrated repeatedly. And of course, beta cell failure is by definition what type 1 diabetes is. MMTT stimulated C-peptide is a highly reproducible measure tested in many different settings in many different places. And that cross-trial analysis demonstrate this robust consistency when you adjust for age and baseline. But what about hypoglycemia or complications? This is not likely to be useful because most people through the first few years of diagnosis are above the DCCT level of clinically significant C-peptide that Mike introduced you to and which is associated with a reduction in hypoglycemia and complications. This is illustrated in this data, again, from almost 200 individuals. If we look at the top line here, it's looking at the proportion of individuals who had detectable C-peptide. In this illustration, even two years from diagnosis, more than 90% of individuals had detectable C-peptide. But perhaps more relevant is the notion of the clinically uh, significant level of C-peptide. If you look a year from diagnosis, more than 90% will be at this level. And this is the control groups. 60% will do that at two years post-diagnosis. And as I'll show you subsequently, of course, this proportion will continue to decrease over time. 
But it does highlight again the challenges in looking for these other measures within a year from diagnosis. So unless you do a trial with a four-year endpoint, hypoglycemia or complications, which are associated with clinically significant levels of C-peptide, are unlikely to be appropriate outcomes. The other point to highlight here is that clinically significant levels is present in most people, as I've just showed you, but that this level is far from normal. This is extrapolating a, the DCCT stimulated C peptide clinically significant level to what a fasting level would be that would be the equivalent, and comparing it to fasting C peptide levels obtained from the national normal populations that are published by the CDC, the NHANE studies. This is the level 0.3 fasting C peptide, which is the fifth percentile of a normal healthy population. And this is the level you'd expect at the 50th percentile of healthy adolescents ages 12 to 19. And you can see readily how a normal level of C-peptide is a lot higher than the clinically significant C-peptide that we have talked about um, to date. So what does this look like at a more population level? This is data from the SEARCH study, which is an epidemiology study evaluating diabetes in youth. Of almost 3,000 individuals who were antibody positive, their C-peptide was evaluated. And within a year of diagnosis, now boxed here in this red, almost 90%, just like the other data I shared with you, are at or above that clinically significant DCCT level. In fact, a third are above the fifth percentile, though only 7% are above the healthy population 50th percentile level, as you can see here. So if you're doing a trial within a year of diagnosis, even among a pediatric population, a large percentage will be above the DCCT clinically significant threshold without any additional therapy. However, if you continued your trial so that your outcomes would three and four years, you can readily see that now you're at a situation where unless the people receive treatment, you will not have preserved C-peptide and likely therefore be able to start looking for those associations with other clinically relevant numbers. What about HbA1c or insulin dose? HbA1c is not likely to be useful because there's an ethical requirement to maintain A1c per standard of care in all the trials. An insulin dose is not likely to be useful because it depends on a lot of other variables. In my experience in seeing patients for trials for more than 30 years, there's a big difference in insulin dose in the typical teenage boy and our marathon runner. So unless you do a trial with very large numbers of people and similar insulin delivery opportunities and let randomization address these issues, neither of these are gonna be robustly reproducible outcomes in trials within the year or so from diagnosis. Finally, wanna emphasize that while there is no clear threshold identified, it is absolutely clear that higher residual secretion is needed for clinically important messages. We did a study here published uh, a couple, last year in which we looked to ask the question, what is the level of MMTT stimulated C-peptide that would be physiologically relevant? We selected four cohorts of people according to their peak C-peptide and categorized them as having negative, that is below the threshold of detection used for that assay, low, medium, or high levels of C-peptide. And we had them undergo a variety of tests within a month to assess what is the level that would be important for responses that are important physiologically. And as you can see here, first, on the right side, where we're looking from the CGM data across the people that were from low to high levels of C-peptide, and as expected, the mean glucose is lower in those people that had more residual insulin secretion. And it's particularly evident here when you look at the percentage of time in range among the people that had the highest levels of C-peptide, there clearly was an increased time in range. However, even though all of those that were in that highest level of peak C peptide were greater than 50% time in range, one can readily see when we now plot the individual data 
though there's a strong relationship, there's no clear threshold as to what level of C-peptide would be best to assure appropriate time and range. Similar data is emphasized here. This is in response to hypoglycemia from a clamp condition. Again, we had our different groups with no C-peptide or very high C-peptide. And it's readily apparent that though there is variation within the group, those with the higher levels of C-peptide had a more physiological response to hypoglycemia with secretion of glucagon. But once again, when plotted individually, though there is this strong relationship, there is no clear threshold that will say that this is the level needed to have an appropriate glucagon response to hypoglycemia. This data was put together in a graphic uh, abstract and it's really just, again, serving to emphasize that among a healthy islet has normal physiological responses, which results in normal glucose tolerance ranges. But as you have less and less C-peptide, you will have wider excursions and higher glucose levels. And this is reflected by abnormalities in response to glucose or arginine in terms of your beta cell or your alpha cell response. Similarly, an abnormal response in relation to hypoglycemia is clearly related to the amount of residual insulin secretion that you have present. So to summarize my presentation, while there is significant variation between individuals with new onset diabetes with respect to both baseline and the rate of change, residual beta cell function around the time of diagnosis age and baseline secretion explain much of the variation. Indeed, cross-trial analysis demonstrates robust consistency in the natural history of C-peptide when these variables are accounted for. The consistency is so strong, it can be reliably used to predict secretion at one year. That clinically significant amounts of C-peptide are present in most people within a few years of diagnosis. And it is this fact that limits the likelihood that successful preservations of beta cells with therapy will be robustly and repeatedly associated with other clinical measures. While no clear threshold is identified, however, higher residual secretion is needed for clinically important measures, including time and range and response to hypoglycemia. So what are the key messages we've really heard through this session? First, C-peptide should be considered a validated surrogate endpoint because it is a measure of the disease itself. It's measuring beta cell function and the disease is destruction of beta cells. Endogenous secretion is key for normal physiology. Epidemiological data, so associations with C-peptide and clinical outcomes, all these points demonstrated in the presentation by Dr. Harold. Dr. Rickel showed a tremendous amount of data illustrating that by removing individual variation, replacing islets convincingly demonstrates a strong causal relationship between C-peptide and clinically important results. However, as I've illustrated, unlikely we are unlikely to demonstrate the impact of preservation on variables such as hypoglycemia or insulin use within the first year or two of diagnosis because most untreated individuals are above clinically significant levels during that time. And finally, the observed heterogeneity in C-peptide can be explained by age and baseline, which can be used to reliably predict C-peptide, which has implications, as I've mentioned, for study participants and as you'll hear later around study design and analysis from T. Ponson. Thank you very much for your presentation.